Well, let's go ahead and get underway. Tonight, uh, as our opening prayer, I'm just going to use the uh, prayer appointed for Reformation Day in Lutheran Book of Worship. Almighty God, gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your, <coughs> your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, the New Testament book of James. Um, I've included in the comments um, a little document, a bit about James. I try to open these studies with kind of an overview of some important information about the books. Um, we'll go through this, maybe get into chapter one, I hope tonight, but at any rate, um, we'll begin by giving a little bit of an overview. And uh, this time, um, all of the, well, not all, but most of the Bible passages that I cite um, in this document will be hyperlinked so we can uh, read the uh, passages to which I refer as we go through this. That might help a little bit as well. So what about this book of James? Well, the first thing to be said is that there are five different people named James mentioned in the New Testament. And for various reasons, all but one um, are pretty much dismissed by scholars as, as being the James. It was not James, the brother of John, for example. He was martyred very quickly after Jesus' death and resurrection, you'll recall. Um, so there are a number of reasons why um, James is the one on whom we settle. This particular James is a son of Joseph and Mary. He's referred to as uh, Jesus' half-brother, but of course um, Jesus was not genetically related to Joseph and Mary, and, uh, but it's a convenient way of understanding. He was raised in the same household in which Jesus was raised. Uh, his nickname was James the Just. And we, you could see this as James the Fair-Minded One or James the Justified One. And I tend to think it's that. And I'll explain why I think that here in a moment. Like the rest of Jesus' family at Nazareth, um, even Mary sometimes, it seems, uh, James was skeptical of Jesus' claims of being Lord and Messiah, and maybe even a bit embarrassed by him. Take a look at John 7, 3 to 5, which is hyperlinked in that document. Let me know if you're able to get to that. I'm going to click on it here. I'm able to. I hope you're able to as well. If you're not, let me know. I'm going to go ahead and read John 7, 3 to 5. So his brothers, these are his, this, this is something we just looked at week before last in the adult Sunday school class at Living Water. And this is literally Jesus' brothers who are wary of him. This would include Jude, who is an author of another book in the New Testament. And they're, they possibly are mocking him. They possibly are trying to think of uh, a good PR move on the part of Jesus in this Messiah business. But we read, so his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. 
for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. If you do these things. They've heard reports of uh, Jesus performing signs, so they're saying, if you do these things, then go show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. That's directly from the Gospel of John. So James is in this number of uh, Jesus' Nazareth family who do not believe in him. We'll take a look at another one of those passages, Matthew 12, 46 to 47. There we read, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Now, if you read on in this section, uh, they even try to say, oh, he's crazy. Now, it's possible that Mary was doing this out of a simple effort to uh, shield her uh, son Jesus from harm or danger. Uh, but it seems that based on what John tells us, there are at least mixed motives on the part of the family in all of this. And again, James would have been among those who did not believe in Jesus at this point in Jesus' ministry. Take a look finally at Mark 3, 21. There we read, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. So, uh, again, Jesus was not receiving great support from his family. And this, as I say, would include James. Now, uh, this is a little bit of what Jesus experienced just with the townspeople in Nazareth. And remember, he said a prophet is not acceptable in his own hometown. Um, and that definitely proved to be the case with Jesus. You remember they tried to kill him uh, when he returned to Nazareth after beginning his ministry. So James is in this group. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. James then becomes the only person who had not believed in Jesus or followed Jesus prior to his crucifixion and resurrection who encounters the risen Jesus. Uh, the other person is the Apostle Paul. Uh, take a look at, and again, it's in the document under point number three, take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, 7. There Paul says, Then he, that is the risen Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And um, from very early in the history of the church, the James who was identified here was James, the brother of Jesus as the one to whom Jesus appears. Um, James then becomes eventually uh, a leader, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Um, it seems that Peter became less significant in Jerusalem and was doing more of, um, you know, an apostolic evangelistic ministry, and James was there in Jerusalem with the church, and we see him play a very important role in Acts, in accepting the mission and ministry of Paul, you remember, the council at Jerusalem, because there was concern that uh, among the Jewish Christians, that Gentile Christians were not being respectful of Jewish customs. And of course, the uh, compromise that emerged, and it was articulated by James himself, was that the Gentiles did not have to become uh, Jews before they became Christians, but they asked then that the Christians fulfill uh, three conditions by which they would be respectful of the Jewish Christians. And of course, this was a major uh, 
confrontation in the early church. It was the first big church fight, and we talked about that before. So uh, Peter, or excuse me, James played a major role in seeing to it that the mission of the church, as envisioned by Jesus and laid out in the Great Commission, would move forward with both Jews and Gentiles who believed in Christ being part of the body of Christ, the church. Now, it's interesting because um, point four on my uh, document here, James was among the last books to be accepted into the New Testament canon. Others that were disputed were First and Second Peter and Hebrews and Revelation. And uh, uh, these are called the disputed books often because in one of the first uh, documents that listed uh, the New Testament canon, which came, uh, a document that came out of Rome, it did not include, oh, you're not able to open the document link, Bill. Hmm. Let me see if there's anything I can do to enable that. Uh, well, let me do this. I'm also going to include the original uh, Word document. I'm glad you told me. Let me put a link to the Word document here. Um, open that up in the comments, Bill. And something happened there where someone's name was added in. I don't know where that even came from. Let me get rid of that. And I'll start over again. Well, there's something getting in the way of my sharing that, so I'll work on that for tomorrow evening. I apologize. Some someone has gotten in the midst of my share here. Let me try another way. Okay, it should be in there now. Uh, try clicking on the new comment, and you should be able to get to the links, Bill, and anybody else. So I'm on uh, point four, and I'm talking about the these disputed books. James was among those. There was an early list that came out of Rome that did not include James or these other disputed books. However, there were other lists that came from other centers of the Christian faith, of the church around the Mediterranean basin that did include these books, and ultimately the church decided that they belonged in the book. But as it relates in the Bible, as it relates to James, there were several reasons why James was among the disputed books. And some of this will be familiar to folks, particularly Lutherans, uh, because of uh, Luther's, let's put it this way, ambivalent feeling about the book of James. Um, A is his heavy emphasis on the law and no explicit statement on how sinners are justified for uh, or saved for life with God through Christ. The second reason for this um, hesitation on the part of some to accept James into the canon is the fact that James was not an apostle uh, like Matthew, Mark, John, Peter, and Paul. And of course, Matthew uh, historically, uh, even, well, we'll put it this way, um, historically, 
Um, Matthew, some have thought he was the apostle, some have thought he wasn't. Mark, it was said, was a kind of second generation or a younger Christian who um, uh, took his information from Peter. Matthew was not disputed. I'm sorry. Mark was uh, uh, took his narrative from Peter. Uh, Luke, it was said, took his narrative from Paul. Um, all of those figures were undisputed apostles. But on top of that, there was an agreed upon, or there is an agreed upon, understanding of what the proclamation of the apostles was. We have that in the Apostles' Creed, which is a summary of the early church's teaching, for example. But uh, James was not seen as an apostle by most people. Uh, but apost apostolicity uh, is an important condition for inclusion in the New Testament. And so people said, well, James was not an apostle. And he doesn't claim, like Luke um, or Mark, to be basing, uh, or there was no tradition saying that they were basing their uh, accounts on what an apostle specifically said. Luke, of course, says that he made a careful study and he listened to what people who were there at the time said, um, which is uh, apostolicity in essence. But James, as well as Jude, were not regarded by most people, are not regarded today as having been apostles. Paul, of course, became an apostle as a result of seeing the risen Jesus. That was part of the basis of his authority that he had encountered uh, uh, Jesus in person. Uh, now, let me just stop right there. Judy writes, what does it mean he uh, took his narrative from the others? Okay. Uh, tradition says that Luke, who we know was an associate of Paul, um, was not one of the original apostles. We call him Luke the Evangelist, the good newser, if you will, uh, because he has taken his, um, he's gathered the information, and particularly from Paul, who knew about Jesus' uh, life, death, and resurrection. And Luke undoubtedly knew others of the apostles and first Christians as well. Mark has traditionally thought to be the young man who um, I think ran naked through the Garden of Gethsemane at one point, and it's thought that he was a protege of Peter. Well, Peter and Paul are definitely apostles. The thing is that what, what, the, what got books into the New Testament was their consistency with the proclamation of the apostles about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So, for example, there are false gospels like the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Thomas. There are bunches of them. And just a kind of cursory look at them, if you were to read a couple of chapters, you would say, this doesn't ring true at all. For example, in one of the false gospels, I think it's in the, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, um, the boy Jesus gets mad at uh, some kids. I can't remember the specific specifics of it. Maybe maybe others of you will remember this, but uh, he worked a sign or a miracle that killed them. Well, I mean, <laughs> this is just not consistent with what we know about Jesus. So the early church was very anxious to ensure the purity and the truthfulness of anything that got into the New Testament. So they very prayerfully approached what they would regard as sacred 
and would see as being on a par with the Old Testament scriptures. So um, that's what I meant by that. I hope that clarifies, Judy. So um, one thing that should be said is that several of the early church fathers uh, said that, and by the way, the church fathers are the second generation preachers and teachers and beyond. Up to about the fifth century, we call them the church fathers. They were the ones who very assiduously uh, worked on ensuring the authenticity of the New Testament canon. And they give witness to what the early church thought. So with some of these folks going back to late first and early second centuries, we have very accurate information about how the church received the proclamation about Christ from the apostles themselves. Um, you know, it's almost like getting an email from yesterday uh, in terms of the ancient world because it took such a long time for information to travel, a long time for things to get written down. The early church started doing this fairly soon in its life because uh, either by martyrdom or simple aging, the first generation of Christians were dying off and the church wanted to ensure that the proclamation about Jesus was authentic and true to Jesus' actual life and death and resurrection. So we rely on these church fathers, not just for uh, uh, assuring us of the authenticity of the word, which assurance ultimately comes to us from the Holy Spirit who gives us the gift of faith, but also just to understand um, the thoughts and practices of the early church. So, I digress. The early church fathers, um, there among them were some who regarded James as an apostle. Eusebius, who lived in the third and fourth centuries, called James an apostle. Jerome in the fourth century, and these are very towering figures in the history of the church, um, uh, Jerome in the fourth century also called James an apostle. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it so, but it does convey to us, number one, the authority of James's word, how it was regarded by the early church, and number two, um, their comfort with what he wrote uh, as being, although in different vocabulary than we find in Paul's writing, for example, nonetheless faithful to Christ and the gospel. Others, others of the church fathers um, described James as an episkopos, that is a bishop of the early church. Now, if you are able to see uh, the document, episkopos is a compound word from the Greek in which the New Testament was written. It's composed of epi, which means upon or over, and skopos, we get telescope, microscope. It means sea. So epi over sea. They were overseers. And this is the word that we use today for bishops in the early church they, no more than we do today, did not have consistent definitions for titles like bishop, pastor, elder, presbyter, deacon. Uh, every church practiced things a little differently. There was a particular difference between Gentile churches and Jewish churches in the way they operated. And in some churches, Women, because of the culture, were not allowed to have any kind of authority. And in other churches, because 
of the culture. Women were allowed to have authority within the church. Uh, so there were all kinds of organizational structures. Um, there is no one organizational structure laid down for us in the New Testament for the church. At any rate, James was, it, as it emerges in Acts, you see, the leader of uh, the church in Jerusalem, which would have, of course, been an overwhelmingly, if not entirely, Jewish Christian church. Um, I could go on about that, but there's no need to do that. So you see that uh, James was regarded as an important figure. Nonetheless, he was probably not an apostle, certainly not on a par with Matthew, Mark, John, Peter, or even Paul, uh, because we have no record of, uh, of what he saw of Jesus, only that he saw Jesus risen from the dead. Now, going on to another reason that people were wary of giving James a place in the New Testament is the fact that one of the early listings of the New Testament books um, did not include him. I mentioned that already. Then D, Jesus is explicitly mentioned, and this is interesting, he's explicitly mentioned only a few times, two, maybe three times in the whole book of James. But the very first reference is the very first verse. And uh, James talks about himself as a servant of God and of Jesus. Um, ultimately, as I say, the church accepted the canonicity of these disputed books, including James. It did, of course, reject others. Um, the Roman Catholic Church embraces the Apocrypha. Uh, we won't even get into that right now, but some Bibles you'll find include the Apocrypha. Lutherans, Protestants, and Jews do not accept the Apocrypha as being part of the Bible. Okay, that's enough about that. There are disputes uh, as to whether there are definite thematic through lines in James's letter. Um, and I won't get into all of the weeds here, but I believe that there are strong, well-developed themes in the book. And it also contains a chain, or if you will, a disconnected chain, or a seemingly disconnected chain, that's the better way of putting it, of wisdom saying. Some people have said that James is a New Testament book of Proverbs. And I see what they're saying. Uh, but this would have been a manner in which Jews uh, to whom James was writing would be accustomed uh, to having their, their truth served up to them. So he's using this genre of wisdom literature or paranetic literature um, to convey some important themes. What's going on here? James is writing to Jews who are facing persecution. That is, Jewish Christians who are facing persecution. And uh, the commentator Geese has written, I think very persuasively, that the overarching theme of James is this. The gifts of God and the use of the gifts. And if you're interested, well, I'll go ahead and read the quote from him. He says, God generously grants blessings pertaining to all three articles of the Apostles' Creed, including the first, uh, including the uh, gift of being the first fruits of the new creation. One can recognize the children of God the Father, who are brothers and sisters of Christ, by the fact that they reflect these gifts and use them as God intends. So, what is he saying here? God gives us a number of gifts, and all of his gifts are perfect. The call of the person who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord, as James does in the very first verse of this book, 
is to use the gifts of God in ways that glorify God and benefit the neighbor. When we fail to do so, that doesn't throw our salvation away. It means that we're human beings, we're saints and sinners. But a fruitful life is one in which we use the gifts in a way that honor, honors God and helps our neighbor. So this is the overarching uh, theme, I think, of James, the gifts of God and the use of those gifts. And James is going to address all of this throughout the book. Another major theme or a sub-theme is what uh, the theologians call eschatology. Now, eschatology is, is about the last things. And it can mean the fulfilled things, that is, that the kingdom of God comes to us in Jesus Christ and how that works out in our lives. That's what we would call uh, eschatology within history or eschatology within our lives. In other words, if we know how the story ends in Jesus Christ, we belong to him and we know we will belong to him forever, then the aim, uh, uh, the, the ultimate uh, goal and the ultimate destination of our lives is established. But in a kind of realized eschatology, we live with the boldness and love that the gospel frees us to live. So if I know that I belong to God now and forever through Christ, then it empowers me to aim my life Godward and love my neighbor with more abandon not worrying about what the world may ultimately do to me because I know beyond the ultimate things that the world can do to me, which is literally death and taxes, that beyond what the world can do to me, huh, I belong to God forever. So I can love more recklessly. I can give away the gospel more recklessly. The other kind of eschatology is... Um, knowing that I am imperfect in this world and I want to live toward that, I, I was going to say end point, point, but I'm going to say toward that beginning point when Jesus will return to the earth and the new heaven and the new earth will come to those who have been raised from their graves and have trusted in Christ in this life and we will be citizens of this new kingdom. We are part of that uh, throng of white-robed people that we'll be uh, hearing about in Revelation this coming Sunday when we celebrate All Saints Sunday. So uh, it's, it's both kind of eschatology that's going on here in James. In other words, living our uh, lives in light of the fact that we belong to God forever. That's the basic idea. So that's another uh, theme that goes on here. And in the midst of this, James is saying essentially the same thing that Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 23, which is, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he, Christ, who promised, is faithful. So it's living as though you really believe Jesus rose from the dead and that Jesus really saved you and that Jesus really liberated you from sin and death and liberated you to be part of a new creation, not always looking out for number one because you know God is already looking out for you. That's the idea. So that's a big theme. Now, Geese uh, identifies six major themes in the book in the letter here. Trials and testing. These are all gifts from God, by the way. And we may not see them as such. Trials and wisdom, uh, trials and testing, wisdom, wealth, the parousia, that is the second coming of Jesus, which gives us assurance, our bodies and our minds, and faith and salvation. So these are six gifts that James is going to talk about in this book. This book 
Um, one of the things that drove Luther crazy about it was he thought it wasn't well organized, kind of like this presentation tonight. Uh, he, he thought that the book of James wasn't well organized. In fact, I think it's very well organized, tightly organized. But what he does, James will start out, uh, he starts out with this theme about gifts, and then he'll talk about trial and testing. He'll give examples and counterexamples. And then he will go into wisdom, but he may go back to testing because they're building blocks. We need wisdom in facing trials and testing. What James is trying to help people do is deal with the reality of suffering for their faith in Christ. He's not writing a book about uh, what we call theodicy, which is, you know, the, the mystery of how a great and gracious and loving and all-powerful God can allow suffering in our world. That's a whole other subject uh, that is dealt with in other places, like the book of Job in the Old Testament. This is um, suffering for our faith within this world, um, suffering as a result of the difficulty of being a Christian in this world. So trials and testing. So he'll go from there and he'll talk about wisdom as a way of dealing with trials and testing. The same thing then when he goes to talking about wealth and poverty, he'll he'll loop it back to the discussion of wisdom. So it's a connected chain all the way through, but it's uh, all about these six gifts that God gives to us and how we are to use them within this time-bound, sin-bound world until the return of Christ. All right, so that's kind of what James is doing in this, I think, beautiful letter. Now, my sixth point here is, and this is often disputed, or it's not as apparent to us as we might like it to be. There is both law and gospel in James. Now, of course, in Lutheran theology and in other um, theologies, uh, law deals with the commands of God, um, which in turn show us our inability to live righteously or to live a perfectly sinless lives, which then drives us to the promise of God, which we now have in the gospel. God promised um, his people. He promised the world a savior all the way back in Genesis 3, 15. And of course, all through the Old Testament, God kept pointing to a savior. When we looked at Ezekiel, we saw places in which the pre-incarnate Christ appeared. So um, all of history has moved toward the Christ uh, and the gospel promise. So we have those two categories. The gospel comes to us and says, Christ has forgiven you all your sins. He has given you eternal life. He's done everything necessary for that. Your call is to trust in Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Uh, it is God who does the giving and we receive. And throughout this book, James is telling the people to whom he is writing, receive this grace, receive this promise, receive this gospel. Um, so, but it's not done in the same way that you see it done in Paul's writing. Uh, and what causes us some confusion here, and I point this out in the handout, is that he, his use of the word law is more like the way the term is used in the Old Testament than it is by Paul in the New Testament. Take a look at Psalm 1. Psalm 1. You probably could already recite this. It begins, verse 1 of Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, 
nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight in, is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, what the psalmist is saying here is that the faithful person cherishes the law of God, but it's more than the commands of God. It is the Torah. It is the whole way of God or the whole way of life for the person who would fall, uh, follow God. So the law can sometimes refer to the whole word of God, both commands and promises, undeserved promises from God. When uh, we'll find James is going to use a, a phrase that really seems weird to us. He talks about the perfect law of liberty. Well, that seems incongruous to us because we know that the law condemns and the gospel sets us free. The law condemns our sins and the gospel says your sins are forgiven, not because you've obeyed the law, but because Christ obeyed the law for you on the cross, uh, up to and including the cross, I should say. He led an, a perfectly obedient life. But what James is saying here, he, he is using the term law of liberty, I believe, as a kind of synonym for the gospel, uh, which is to say, this is... How uh, Lewis would put it as the deeper magic. There's magic in the in the, the world of Narnia. The deeper magic is that when you mess up under the stipulations of the old magic, which is the law, the commands of God, then this deeper magic comes along, which is the gospel, which erases the power of sin and of its consequence, death over us, and gives us liberty. It gives us freedom from sin, death, condemnation, darkness, futility. And it gives us forgiveness, life, eternity with God, and purpose. All of those things. So I think it's a matter of, of nomenclature. Paul was far more conversant with the Gentile world than James. James was a man of Judaism. Paul was a Jew, but he knew the Gentile world. And he was the apostle to the Gentile world. So he was using nomenclature and ideas that, or terms that they would understand. But it's the same law and the same gospel that James and Paul are proclaiming. We're going to see this, I think, with some clarity as we go through the book. The old hymn says, Sets, set our hearts at liberty, right? So this is the law of liberty to which James is referring. James contains, and this is really important, James contains all of these pithy sayings and um, you know, that, that we quote often in the church. Uh, they're snappy. They're good. But some of them can be misused. In fact, we will see one when we get to it tomorrow night uh, that gets misused all the time in chapter one of, of James. And this is why I think it's important to note, uh, just in my study, I think there's probably no book of the Bible from which it is more dangerous to quote a random verse out of context. Uh, I mentioned the structure of James and how everything is knit and purled, knitted and purled together. Huh? So everything from James needs to be read within the context of God's good and perfect gifts promise of the gospel, and I would add the call then to live in the law of liberty, in the freedom of the gospel. Otherwise, a lot of times when you just pull stuff out of James, 
without the context, it sounds like condemnatory legalism. Some of it can sound like um, a fake gospel too, if it's just taken out of context. So it's, it's a short book that's meant to be read kind of together or in a, in a sitting. Indeed, um, most scholars believe that um, James was uh, composed to be read during worship. Well, that was true of all of the letters, really, uh, whether by Paul or, or anyone else. They were, they were circular letters that were read as um, explications of the Word of God to be read along with um, the Scriptures uh, as people gathered for worship. So in a sense, they're sermons, um, and they would be circulated among churches. They'd be copied down and passed on and so forth. So uh, James is a short letter, and I think you can imagine the early Jewish Christians facing persecution, listening to this letter, reading this letter, and being assured and, and uh, being affirmed in the fact that God had gifted them with faith and salvation and all of these other gifts, and they lived in, uh, in the freedom of the gospel. So you just have to be careful when quoting James um, and understanding the whole book um, as you consider individual passages. At the end of the document, I just mentioned uh, some resources that um, I'm pulling from. Uh, for one, uh, for something that you might want to read on your own for devotions, the devotional book by Robert M. Heller, Finding Christ in the Straw, uh, published by 1517, is very good. And uh, the reason for the title is because Luther called this the Epistle of Straw. And what Hiller, a Lutheran pastor, is arguing is you can find Christ and the gospel in the book of James. Well, uh, I kind of thought we might not get to the book itself um, as I tried to give you that background. I just think it's helpful to put things in context uh, when we look at these books. I hope that this was helpful and that it will be helpful as we move on and and uh, Bill, I hope you were able to... Yeah, I see you got it. Okay, good. Um, and hi, Renee. I just noticed you there. So I'm glad that you all were here. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll include prayers for Rick as we close tonight. Gracious God and King, we thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for all of your gifts. We thank you that Christ has come to give us salvation and that your Holy Spirit has used Christ the Word and the Word about Christ to give us the gift of faith that assures us that we belong to you forever and calls us to live out our faith in the certainty that you are with us always and that your promises, your promises of forgiveness and everlasting life are true. Lord, we lift Rick up to you. We pray that you would bring him healing. As we approach the end of this church year too, Lord, we pray your blessings on all of our congregations. And as we move toward Advent, that we would not only anticipate the coming of Christmas, but also anticipate the fact that the Savior Jesus is coming back and the Savior Jesus is with us now. Help Rick to, to understand and appreciate uh, the depths of your love for him, that you are standing with him in this challenging procedure and in the healing beyond. We pray, Lord, that you would guide those who care for him. Lord, we ask for an end to the conflict in the Middle East. It's just such a mess, and we don't 
understand everything about it. Would we pray for an end to that conflict? We pray, too, for an end uh, to the invasion of Ukraine. And we pray for our country. We pray that you would send workers into the harvest, disciples sharing the good news of Jesus into our world, lifting Christ up as the hope for this life and the next. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. I look forward to being here with you tomorrow night, 9 p.m. We will start right in with chapter 1, uh, by the grace of God. See you soon. God bless.